Before there was Star Trek Discovery, before there was the rebooted 2009 Star Trek universe, before there was Star Trek Online and a number of other games that preceded it, there was Star Trek the role-playing game by FASA. First published in 1983, not long before the release of Star Trek III The Search for Spock. FASA published volumes and volumes of world-building material about the Star Trek universe, as it was known at that time including literally hundreds of starship designs and detailed backstories about the Federation, Klingons, Romulans, Orions, and even the Gorn. I believe it is necessary to give credence to this universe because a lot of the starships I resurrect on this channel are FASA starships. A lot of old core Star Trek fans also played the FASA games, and some of this may conflict with the established Trek canon. A long story short, the Star Trek license was revoked from the FASA Corporation in 1989, about the time when Star Trek The Next Generation was becoming popular. The reasons for this are ironic by today's Star Trek standards, but I'll get into that in a moment. Now first I have to mention that this was not the first time a lot of Star Trek game content was rendered completely non-canon, and by proxy created an alternate Star Trek universe due to license shenanigans. Oh how history can repeat itself. I refer to a Starship combat game called Starfleet Battles created in 1979 by Task Force Games, based on the old series and animated series, and although the ship designs and races weren't fleshed out to the extent that they were in FASA, Paramount had taken ownership of the Star Trek license so that they could make some Star Trek movies. But Task Force Games was allowed to continue their publications with a special license so long as their current content didn't touch any of the movie material. And that universe was called the Starfleet universe rather than the Star Trek universe. Even though they still had the Federation, the Klingons, Romulans, it was considered an alternate universe and still kind of sort of thrives in that manner. But let's move forward. A lot of creative content for Star Trek The Next Generation was extrapolated from the fastest Star Trek material. Also true of computer games down the line such as Star Trek Legacy and Star Trek Armada 2 and not to mention so many computer mods, but also concepts such as the war with the Klingons as seen in Star Trek Discovery. In the FASA content, there is a corresponding four years war with the Klingons, and that took place in the time right before Captain Pike was in command of the Enterprise. But man, as I compose this, I realize there's so much to cover in the FASA Star Trek universe, and so many creative derivatives, I hardly know where to begin. So let's just start with the time period. FASA content began to be written before Star Trek III The Search for Spock. So what you have is an ambiance that's consistent with the Star Trek movies, especially The Wrath of Khan in Star Trek III. So let's compare the interstellar politics to the current canon by examining the FASA star map. The position of the Romulan and Klingon empires relative to the Federation is pretty similar in both universes. There is still the neutral zones with both empires, both created after big interstellar wars, the Klingons and the Romulans still share a border, but one notable difference is that there is an area where the Federation, Klingon, and Romulan territory converges called the Triangle, where renegade states, pirates, privateers, and independent merchants live, but also where skirmishes between Romulans, Klingons, and sometimes the Federation are not uncommon. Another notable difference is that in the FAS universe, similar to the Starfleet Battles universe, the Gorn do not share a border with the Klingons, but the Romulans instead. And in all universes other than canon, it is the Romulans and Gorn who are the rivals, rather than the Klingons and Gorn. The Federation and all its member factions and races are really not all that different. The Orions are also very similar to what we see in the Orion Syndicate and in the game Star Trek Online which perhaps not so coincidentally portrays the Orions as already having a close relationship with the Klingons, as they did in the FASA universe. Which leads us to the Klingons. Now this was a time before there was a lot of on-screen content about Klingon culture. In normal Star Trek canon, the Klingons are very honorable, but often kind of like the crazed berserkers of Viking culture. In the FASA universe, although there is honor, it is secondary to the acquisition of power through conquest and battle. FASA Klingons are opportunistic and totalitarian, kind of in a way that Cardassians are. 
FASA also has a fair explanation of why some Klingons look human. In fact, in the FASAverse, they can look Vulcanoid or Orion. The theory is that to better adapt to colony worlds, genetic manipulation was used to alter certain colonists and adapt them to alien environments. So the Klingons with ridges were referred to as Imperial Klingons, and they were still considered of slightly higher genetic class than the Klingon human fusions. Ironically, it's actually the Romulans who are considered slightly more honorable than Klingons. I mean, in some ways, this kind of corresponds to what happened in Balance of Terror, where the Romulan commander clearly has a lot of honorable morals. Now, although the Romulans consider themselves superior and believe they have a manifest destiny of expansion all the way to the core of the galaxy, they have a fairly intricate honor code in the FASA Trek. Also in the FASA timeline, the Romulans are encountered by Earth far earlier than the Klingons are, like we saw in the Enterprise episode. But the Romulans and Klingons had made contact long before the humans had made contact with either, and the result was a very exhausting war for three years. It's believed that this is a part of the reason why the Romulans were so hostile to Earth when they were first encountered, since the first major civilization encountered by the Romulans at that time were the Klingons. So you can understand the Romulans' attitude towards most other starfaring civilizations. Now this YouTube channel is about ships, and Romulan and Klingon ships end up being fairly different in FASA. This all starts with the Klingon Bird of Prey, another topic of great controversy. So this is what happened. When the original Star Trek III script was written, the antagonists were going to be Romulans. A Romulan ship was then designed. The director, Leonard Nimoy, sort of changed his mind and said, no, let's make the ship bird-like, but let's use Klingons instead since they're more theatrical. So the script was altered to say that the Klingons had captured a Romulan ship, the Bird of Prey. Krug was supposed to be such a badass that he's able to capture this Romulan ship for the purpose of infiltrating Federation space and stealing Genesis. Apparently there wasn't enough time or budget to include all of this, so they just made the ship a Klingon Bird of Prey. Ifasa had a very elegant solution to this, since we know that up into the movie era, the Klingons and Romulans had kind of a shaky alliance in a technology exchange program. The Bird of Prey hull chassis was said to be a Romulan design, which Klingons completely and totally integrated into their navy to replace the older scouts and destroyers, which means if you're sticking with the FASA universe, there should not be any Klingon Bird of Preys in the Enterprise era and there most certainly should not be cloaking devices, as seen in Discovery. Since, as far as we know, the Romulans and Klingons didn't really have much of an alliance until a bit later. Which gets me into the war between the Federation and the Klingons. Now, as most fans know, by now in Star Trek Discovery, there's a war between the Federation and the Klingons, and the Klingons, who use cloaking devices to great effect, are disorganized and factional, but they still manage to whoop the Federation. I'll just say that this war plot in Discovery kind of explains why CBS and Paramount so aggressively went after the creators of the fan film Axanar, which also featured a war with the Klingons. So CBS and Paramount obviously felt that they needed to protect their universe from other derivatives. But before all of this, FASA had its own version of the war with the Klingons, called the Four Years War. Now there's a number of differences between the FASA version, the Axanar version, and the Discovery version. First, the Klingons did indeed start by seriously whooping some Federation backside and invade all the way into the Axanar system. In the FASA Star Trek, the Klingons are unified unlike in Discovery. They also have no cloaking devices. More than that, neither side had the weapons we're familiar with in modern canon Star Trek. The Federation still use lasers and accelerator cannons rather than photon torpedoes, and the Constitution class, like the Enterprise, was barely in service. The Klingons did not have photon torpedoes at this time, only disruptors. They don't develop photon torpedoes until a bit after the war. The Federation is almost always outnumbered and had to outthink the Klingons, but the Federation does develop photon torpedoes and phasers. They upgrade Starfleet ships with these new weapons and managed to defeat the Klingons by attacking their stretch supply lines and using superior tactics. Eventually, FASA created quite a bit of content, rules, and ships that span the years right into the Next Generation era, with game stats for the Galaxy class, the Ferengi Marauder, and the Romulan Warbird 
all of which could blow something like an Excelsior class completely away as far as shields, weapons, and warp power. Unfortunately, they never got to make stats for the Borg, the Cardassians, and some others since FASA was essentially done after about mid-season 2 of the next generation. If you find FASA stats with the Borg, Cardassian, and even the Vorcha class or Ambassador class ships, those are fan-made concoctions, not original FASA creations. The FASA universe also had an original take on Transwarp Drive, but first, some real canon for context. We know that ships in the old series and movie canon can reach warp 10. We see this in the journey to Babel, when the Orion ship manages warp 10. Later, Sulu mentions in Star Trek 3 that the Excelsior is supposed to have transwarp drive, and this is way back in the late 23rd century. So we fast forward, in Star Trek Voyager, it is declared that warp 10 is impossible. Also, transwarp drive is something that is so advanced only the Borg have truly mastered it so far. Yeah, it's clear that the actual speed of a warp factor is scaled completely different by the late 24th century relative to the 23rd century. FASA has its own version of transwarp drive, fleshed out long before any of the Voyager business. The Excelsior, the rebuilt Enterprise A, the Constellation class, and most other ships beyond Star Trek IV were refit for transwarp drive, which meant, in FASA terms, speeds of up to warp 14. The new transwarp fleet is what it is referred to, which makes perfect sense to me. In Star Trek 3, Scotty is heartbroken when he's told that the Enterprise would get no refit, but would be put out to pasture. It would only make sense that this refit referred to the upgraded new transwarp drive, and the same transwarp drive used by the Excelsior. Now, by the time the Galaxy class is brought into service in the 24th century, transwarp drive is kind of obsolete, and now there's the ultra warp drive. Perhaps we can assume that it is ultra warp speeds when the galaxy is said to have a maximum speed of about warp 9.6. But there are some really interesting, some awesome, some not so great, lost era starship designs by FASA that fill in the gap from the time of the movies to the TNG era. Now a little bit of elaboration on how FASA lost its license. There may be a few reasons, but the most obvious is that the writers of TNG, which still happens to this day, had no regard for any written or game content at that time, and possibly movie content either. The inconsistencies were inevitable. FASA's universe portrayed a Starfleet that seemed more militaristic, kind of like in Star Trek II and Star Trek III, which was something that Gene Roddenberry didn't really care for. And Roddenberry just happened to regain a lot of his pull by the time the next generation got started. FASA was working on an expansion that included military ground assault by the major empires, and it was believed that this expansion was what gained a lot of negative attention by those who controlled the Star Trek license. One can certainly debate, and you're free to in the comments, whether this is a direction Star Trek should go in. Perhaps not, but in my opinion, they could have simply reined FASA in a bit instead of completely revoking the license. But I find it hilariously ironic that these days continuity is blatantly disregarded in favor of more war and conflict in Star Trek. I have to give the FASA writers credit. There seemed to be no continuity mistakes in anything they produced up to that point. They were Star Trek fans through and through, who made sure everything was minimally consistent to build a Star Trek gaming universe as immersive as possible, and that is not easy for such a big franchise even back in the 80s. I treasure that content, and I'm happy to let myself go with my own headcanon in the FASA Star Trek universe with great abandon and joy. Thank you for watching Space Friends. As always, I appreciate your support on Patreon. Be sure to subscribe and like, and feel free to discuss, debate, or put in your two cents in the comments about the FASA Star Trek universe, or the general inconsistency of canon that happens with a lot of sci-fi. Until next time, Space Friends!